So uh, I was going to do slide projections for this, uh, but it really doesn't look like that's going to work in this room with the crappy little projector I've got, and I'm not even going to try and plug into that. So if it's, uh, it's not as visual as, uh, as uh, I'd originally hoped, uh, you'll have to bear with me. Uh, I've also managed to have a, a really sort of um, quite agitated discussion with a conspiracy person earlier, uh, where we started jotting things down on this piece of paper that was lying on the table, uh, you know, sort of notes and diagrams, uh, and those turned out to be my notes, and he's walked off with them. <laughs> so, we have no projection, I don't have my notes, if I appear to be just robotically reading from the computer, it's because I went and uh, handed my notes over to a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Which I think is quite suspicious. Do you think it's a conspiracy? Sorry? Do you think it was a conspiracy against you? Uh, well, I, quite possibly. Quite possibly. Come on in, folks. Speak as you can. So, anyway, uh, just a brief word as to who I am. I'm, uh, my pen name is Pollock. I'm a cartoonist for uh, the New Internationalist magazine. Who you've probably seen on the stall here. I do cartoons for a whole range of radical publications. And movements. Uh, I'm also a member of the Skeptics Movement in Manchester, which of course is very, very hostile to what it sees as superstition and anti-science, which in, in this case would include a lot of conspiracy theories, which aren't really, if you're going to come on in, come on in. No, they're not, aren't really based on fact. So that's really um, background as to who I am. Uh, now, if you come along to this conspiracy workshop, because, uh, well, no, not so much workshop, I think anybody who's not involved in light engineering and uses the term workshop is probably a wanker. Um, to this talk and discussion, uh, and you're here because you're a conspiracy theorist and you think this is your opportunity to talk to people about yeah. how, well, yeah, right, okay. If it's your opportunity, it's your opportunity here to talk about how, you know, uh, that number of shots couldn't possibly be fired at Kennedy with that rifle in that amount of time, or how strange the shadows next to the astronauts on the moon look. We're definitely, definitely not here to try and debunk or defend conspiracy theories. That's definitely not what I want to talk about. If you want to talk to people and convert them to a conspiracy theory, I suggest you sort of try and take them with you, because I'm definitely, definitely not going to be debating whether Building 7 should have fallen or not. All of these things have been debunked multiple times on the net. Well, as I say, I'm, I'm definitely not going to do a presentation about whether 9-11 was an inside job or not. I'm going to talk about the politics of it as an issue. So honestly, if you want to use this as a platform to try and convert other people, it's not really going to work. Um, and that's not what we're here to debate. And I don't think that's what other people are here to, to hear either. Right. So, okay, as you can see, I am absolutely piss sick of debating conspiracy theories. Uh, it seems that you absolutely get nowhere. Uh, it seems that just something that, that doesn't follow the normal rules of, of scientific um, discussion. I have tried running public debates with 9-11 uh, truthers and presented counter-information to what they're saying is an absolutely solid case. And I think I've presented quite solid scientific information. What you find with conspiracy people is that they don't change their mind, having been presented with alternate evidence. You don't then move on to the next stage of the argument like you normally do in science. That's good. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to disappoint you. No, at all. Um, so, sorry, I'm just going to have to get my notes back up here. I was going to read them off a piece of paper. And what I want to say is I think they're very much, um, you know, we're all here to talk about the media and we're all here to talk about wanting to raise standards of, of facts and accuracy within the media. And I think conspiracy theories are very, very relevant to that. And uh, I'll say why several times. I mean, primarily, I think they're a product of the internet. I, I know that during the 1960s, people were, they already started talking about the Kennedy assassination. But there wasn't really a mechanism in place to spread those ideas very, very rapidly. And since the advent of the internet, I think that mechanism is now in place. Now, in terms of talking about the media, I think the internet's an extremely interesting thing because it really does provide a platform for people to spread ideas that you can't get inside the mainstream press, trying to get the mainstream press to talk about the 1%, trying to get them to talk accurately about Occupy movement and so on and so forth, it's extremely difficult. So the internet is extremely positive and it's allowed radicals a platform from which they can spread their ideas and also communicate with each other. But I think in terms of other things that have happened, it's a very double-edged sword. 
Because no matter how much contempt you feel for the mainstream media, and I really do, I think the way in which Murdoch controls what information is passed around within a democracy is poison to the idea of democracy itself. No matter how much contempt you feel for the mainstream media, those parts of it that at least aspire to be proper newspapers, I'm not talking about the sort of red top tabloids, you know, sort of the sport and so on and so forth, but newspapers that at least want a public image of presenting accurate information to others. They do have a min Can I take questions after? Would that be all right? Um, they do have a minimum level of fact checking that goes on. You might not like their political bias. You might not like the fact that they won't cover certain stories. And of course, that's one of the most subtle forms of censorship, is just not talking about things. It isn't as much that you lie about them, you just don't address them. Now, no matter how much contempt you feel for them, they do at least, even for just legal reasons, have some kind of basic commitment to filtering and checking whether the information that they've got in them can actually be verified from sources. The great tragedy of the internet is that there's just no controls. Wikipedia, I think, is an exception because you do have a structure within Wikipedia that will actually control the quality of information there. But apart from that, you can have completely inaccurate stories spread through the internet like wildfire. Now, everybody knows really sort of light-hearted ones like bonsai kittens. Do people remember bonsai kittens? And these kittens that you would glow, grow in a glass jar and you would feed them from one end and you would super glue a tube to the other. And this caused a scandal across the internet, this absolute disgusting act of animal cruelty, which of course was completely fictional. It was somebody with Photoshop just pissing about and it all got completely out of control. There was another example of kittens being used as bait for, for fishing for sharks. Did anyone see that? <laughs> there were websites set up in opposition to it. I mean, you know, so disinformation can spread through the internet like wildfire. And of course, something like bonsai kittens would never have ended up in a newspaper that at least wanted to project an image of respectability. So I think it's a really, really double-edged sword. Um, and one of the great problems with the internet is it is mass consumption. You can sort of say, oh no, you know, like the, the main newspapers reach a really big audience. These bullshit stories only reach a very, very small audience. Well, that isn't actually the case. If you look at the top 10 uh, shape-shifting reptile videos on YouTube, the whole, you know, what in theory should be a, 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 an argument that people are just completely ignoring, that the 1% are alien reptiles who've come and take over. <laughs> Now, I mean, great, we might think that's funny. That is being mass consumed. The 10 most popular videos espousing this idea all have over 1 million hits. And in order to get 1 million hit on YouTube, you are in the top 5% of things that are being looked at on YouTube. So on, a, on one level, this is actually being consumed on a mass level. So I don't think we can sort of say, oh, it's just a strange internet phenomenon. It is actually you know, semi-mainstream these ideas. Now, like I say, sometimes it's just, um, it's just trivial bullshit like bonsai kittens. But sometimes, as a, a radical political campaigner, I think that these ideas start to, um, if you like, stray onto our turf. And I think they do actually start to matter. Um, I mean, one absolutely nonsensical meme that did the rounds was a, an aerial photo of an Occupy demonstration showing just like almost a million people on this demonstration. Did anybody see that one doing the rounds? Uh, it was a complete Photoshop fake. This was in the really early days of Occupy um, Wall Street. It did the rounds as, you know, look what's happening in New York. This is when only about a couple of hundred people were turning up. Somebody put this damn thing there. Somebody then debunked it and said, if you look, this is based on a, um, a Google Maps. And you can see it's, all, it's got exactly the same cars in the street, exactly the same shadows, and somebody's photoshopped this enormous crowd into it and claimed that this was a photograph of the Occupy demonstration. Now, things like that, I think, do start to encroach on our turf because they're discrediting the movement by making it look as if Occupy is making these wild, outrageous claims about how many people are, um, are actually uh, attending their demonstrations. So on the one hand, you know, from bonsai kittens that are quite trivial, you can actually do a lot of political damage by spreading these, these, these false memes. Um, now, I think the great problem here is, is, 
it's easy to sort of say we don't like conspiracy theories, but how do you actually spot and even define a conspiracy theory? And that's a really, really difficult one to tackle. Because I would at least guess that most people here probably subscribe to the idea that the elite 1% are actually organizing the economy in such a way that more wealth is ending up in their hands. I think you'd all subscribe to the idea that the media is actually controlled by a tiny elite uh, and that there's very, very little public access to it. So, you know, some of our rhetoric does greatly resemble this idea that the lizards have come and taken over. Um, so I think it is really, really important to us that we understand what's the difference between our claim and these ones that I think can be discredited. Well, first of all, all the information about what the 1% is doing and who they are and how much wealth they control is publicly available, right? Groups like the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, none of them dispute any of these facts. This is public record information, it's not speculation, it's there for everybody to see. Oxfam agree with it, and Oxfam will have fact-checked before they put a leaflet out. These are mainstream sources where this information comes from. I think that's one of the very first things you need to spot, that the case we're making is actually based on freely available information that isn't being disputed by our enemies. Uh, and I think the WTO are one of our enemies. Um, what's interesting is that people who want to pursue, if you like, more extreme and less verified conspiracy theories tend not to be interested in that. That doesn't seem to satisfy them as enough of a motivation to go ahead and campaign against injustice. They always tend to want to go one step further as if that's actually a boring situation, as if that's a boring world scenario. I don't think it is. I think it's one that galvanizes you to action. But apparently it's not quite exciting enough because everybody else thinks that it's true. And if you want to be this one exclusive person who's very, very similar to Neo from The Matrix, who's hidden on the, you know, stumbled on the truth that nobody else realizes, and all those clever, clever professors and, you know, investigative journalists don't realize it, then it becomes quite ego-flattering to be the one person who's not being listened to. So that's one of the first uh, things I think that you can use to distinguish. Secondly, conspiracy myths are based on speculation and they're based on minor clues and inconsistencies within the mainstream record. Um, now, what I wanted to do is, in the middle of researching this, I actually stumbled across something that, that quite surprised me and uh, I'm, I'm hoping to sort of share it with you now as an example of just how easy it is to be fooled by a piece of information, even though you're somebody who thinks that, no, no, I actually have quite high threshold of critical standards, really, really easy to be fooled. And I just want to see how many of you here think that the number 666 is embedded into every barcode in the world? Anybody? 666, the mark of the beast, is actually embedded into every single barcode in the world? Nobody, nobody thinks that's true? Okay, well you're all wrong. It actually is. Yeah? It's not a bullshit piece of conspiracy. It is actually true. Uh, and I'm very, very quickly going to show you that. I'm sorry I can't project this up. Is anybody roughly able to see that barcode? Yeah. yeah. Okay, you see you've got three spacer bars in the barcode that hang down a little bit lower than the rest of the number. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at every six you see in the barcode, it's those two spacer lines. Two thin vertical bars next to each other is a number six. So built into every barcode is 666. It doesn't read for anything. It's not one of the numbers in the barcode. It's there as a piece of information embedded in the barcode that reads for nothing. Now, how do you dispute that? I mean, there it is in front of your eyes. Two vertical lines mean a six. So 666 is embedded into a barcode. Just right? the long ones. Long yeah, the long ones, yeah. yeah. Now, it took me quite a while to find out that that's actually bullshit. I'm going to read you all the really <laughs> shocked. It's, uh, it's a superficial visual resemblance. I'm really sorry I wasn't able to project this up on the wall. These two small lines are actually, uh, they're called a, a break, and they're where it tells the barcode reader to stop and then start reading numbers, stop. There's the end of the barcode. The sixes, if you notice, have actually got a white space to the right of them. I don't know if you can see that. That's actually what the six is. The six is two 
thin vertical lines with another white bar to the right of it. So they don't actually resemble the two thin bars. A, a six on a barcode is not two thin vertical lines. And I really wanted to show you that just because it's so easy to be fooled. And unless you've got the one piece of information you need, that the white spaces in the barcode code for information in the same way that the black lines do, you could be completely fooled by that. And of course, the first thing I did is go to a site that talks about how barcodes actually work uh, and, and had it actually explained. So quite often, and by the way, if anybody doubts that, I've actually bought along the originals. <laughs> so you can see that I didn't Photoshop them. So that's a really interesting example where, you know, at, at the surface level, something can be utterly convincing. You know? I, well, I, I, when I first heard about 666 and barcodes, I thought, this is Christian evangelical bullshit propaganda, and it can't possibly be true. You know? And when I saw it, I was just really stunned. Uh, like I said, it was only a few days ago, I actually thought, oh my god. The, you know, vision, they seem to be correct. But unless you've got the one extra piece of information that the white space is code as well, and there's no white spaces next to those thin, tall, long ones, you can be completely, completely fooled. And I think this is actually a, a pattern that you see within, if you like, more mainstream conspiracy theories like the chemtrail theory and so on and so forth. You've often got a situation where the claim can actually be easily diffused but you need to actually do quite a lot of research to see that the claim is bullshit. So, for instance, chemtrailers are claiming that they've tested the water below... Everybody knows what I mean by chemtrails, don't you? Yeah? Oh, damn, okay. The chemtrail theory is the theory that the vapour trails that you see behind commercial aircraft are either spraying, um, I think it's population control drugs, mine control drugs, or geoengineering particles to deflect sunlight, and that these will, reduce, uh, these will result in, in a change in the amount of barium and aluminium that you find in, in, in the water below them. So people are claiming that, that this has been done, that they've been tested uh, you know, for these elevated levels of barium. But of course it turns out there are about six different ways in which a chemical like that can get into a puddle in the street. You know, and unless you've got that one extra piece of information and you've actually looked at a peer-reviewed article that says, no, no, I'm somebody who knows about barium and you know, there are different ways that it can get into the water supply and the same with, um, with aluminium, you can actually be very, very easily fooled like, the, um, like with the barcode. So I think one of the things that you always get is there's no consultation or acknowledgement of what experts in the field say about the conspiracy theory. That's a telltale marker, if you like that is an indication that somebody is just making something up or they haven't actually researched it properly. They've researched the first few stages of the argument and then repeat it as if it's a, a fixed truth. Um, and of course that's not how science works. You know, science doesn't work by sowing minor inconsistencies in a the theory and pointing out little strange anomalies in the facts. Um, what you don't do, either, is you don't take one maverick scientist who supports your claims and elevate them to a status of extreme authority. You don't say, I know somebody with a PhD <coughs> after their name who says that chemtrails are mind-controlled drugs. What you do in science is you have to find out what the consensus amongst all of the experts is. And if this is starting to sound a little bit familiar, that's because the tactic of taking a small minority of maverick scientists and elevating them to a position of authority and then dismissing what all the other scientists in that field say is a standard tactic used by climate change deniers and it's used by the creationists. When people say to you, well look, we're making this claim, here we've got three scientists who back us up and they've all been to university and they all have PhD after their name. That is not how science works. That's how creationism works. Because you can find scientists who say that the Earth is only 6,000 years old. That doesn't mean that we should suddenly all start believing in creationism tomorrow. So a few maverick scientists, such as the climate change denial ones, who are funded, you know, if you want to talk about conspiracies, they are the ones who are funded. Their conspiracy theory that all of the climate scientists in the world are lying and only they're telling the truth. They're actually funded. Can we shut the door really quickly? It's really noisy. Um, they're actually funded by the oil industry. So this whole idea of, all oh, we have scientists on our side, 
but ignoring what the rest of the scientists in that field say is another very strong um, telltale marker that they all use exactly the same <coughs> tactics, whether they're talking about the 9-11 incident, whether they're talking about chemtrails, whether they're talking about ghosts, because you can find scientists who think their ghosts are real, or whether they're talking about anti-vaccination. It's always that same tactic that's used of ignoring the mainstream scientists and focusing on a few individuals. Uh, another great one you, you get is that people won't have actually addressed their critics. When you have a mainstream scientific discussion going on, what you'll find is scientist A will say one thing, scientist B will respond and sort of say, well, no, actually, the way in which you conducted that test is not valid. And you actually get a battle between the experts, and you'll find that there's this really sort of long-lasting dialogue that goes on for ages, where people actually listen to each other and then respond to each other's criticisms. You almost never get that within conspiracy theories. You always hear the same debunked information repeated over and over and over again. And to give you a really simple example, is most people who claim that 9-11 uh, was an inside job will tell you that steel doesn't melt at the temperature of, a, of, a, of an ordinary office fire. Now, they're right, steel doesn't melt at the temperature of an ordinary office fire. What it does is it softens and loses its structural strength. It loses something like 70% of its structural strength at the temperature of, a, of an office fire. Which, of course, completely debunks the claim that steel couldn't have melted. But what you don't then find is a dialogue between the conspiracy people and those who are debunking them. They don't then come back punching and say, no, absolutely not, that is not accurate. Steel does not do that. Yeah? You, well, well you, can, you can question, you can always raise this at the end. Mm -hmm. You'll find that, that they don't then re-engage and sort of say, okay, no, that isn't actually the case. You, you get this as a repeated pattern again and again and again. Not only will they not engage with what their critics say, usually they're not even aware of what their critics say. So to take another example, people who say we couldn't possibly go to the moon because there's a belt of radiation around the Earth called the Van Allen belt. Yeah? And if you go through that, you'll be exposed to a lethal dose of radiation. The guy who discovered those radiation belts, Van Allen, which is why they're called the Van Allen belts, has said quite clearly, that's bullshit. You know, that just isn't the case. You could pass through them for a brief time in a spaceship at a certain speed and you wouldn't re receive a, a lethal dose of radiation. I've never once seen somebody who advocates the idea that we didn't go to the moon actually engage with that point. They don't even seem to know that the guy who discovered these radiation belts says that their case is bullshit. So that's really, really interesting. It's often just a one-way stream of information that doesn't actually engage with those who are criticizing it. That's another absolute telltale sign to watch out for. Um, and lastly, you have this kind of, well, sorry, fourth, you have this, this, this foundation that conspiracy theories rely upon that every, every expert in the world who can actually talk about this in a sensible way and actually knows the science and is actually qualified, you know, 97% of them are saying, no, this is nonsense. And yet what you find is there's this immediate accusation that they're all in on the conspiracy. The explanation for why people who really know what they're talking about when it comes to vaccines, when it comes to aluminium levels in, in soil, they get completely ignored and get told that they're part of the conspiracy. And once you have to start doing that, once you have to sort of say that thousands and thousands and thousands of scientists are all lying, the conspiracy theory starts to become so unwieldy that it's just absurd. And it also implies that everybody who disagrees with the conspiracy theory is a moral defective who hasn't got the courage to be a whistleblower. So there's a whole kind of social assumption about how cowardly people are and how cringing they are and how easy it is to control them which of course is an absurd fallback position because we do find that we do have genuine whistleblowers who will come forward when something is actually not true. Uh, and the idea that the majority of the world's scientists or the majority of the world's, say, um, uh, evolutionary biologists are all in on a conspiracy to hide the fact that the Earth is only 6,000 years old is just ridiculous. You see it again and again. No matter what political point of view the conspiracy theory is pushing, you will find that accusation lies at the heart of it. Um, you also do have this very interesting phenomena that 
if you challenge these conspiracy theories, or worse still, if you used to be a believer and then you leave the conspiracy theory and no longer actually advocate it, you tend to find you get a very, very strong violent reaction. First of all, you'll just start getting called a shit and a shill, and you get all this kind of verbal uh, aggression. But somebody called Charlie Veach, who used to be a very, very prominent 9-11 um, conspiracy advocate, and a really, really interesting um, political campaigner, he used to do these kind of very strange street theater events that uh, were really, really quite excellent. He became a truther for a, a very short period of time. And then in the middle of a BBC documentary, actually interviewing engineers who were able to talk about the structure of the towers, changed his mind. Uh, and this caused an explosion within the 9-11 truth movement. Um, he was, I've read the emails that were directed to him, absolutely astonishing about how he's a Jewish little shitbag, how he's a Zionist scumbag, I'm going to fucking kill you. Just pages and pages and pages of verbal abuse. And then somebody hacked into his website uh, and got it to send out emails to all of his friends and relatives saying that he was a paedophile. Uh, I've actually met the guy and discussed this with him. Really quite extraordinary levels of anger get directed to you. A, you know, if you don't agree with the theory, and B, if you're an apostate. Very, very much like within Islam, you have this thing about the death penalty for apostasy. You get that within the conspiracy movement, which is another really, really clear, clear marker that somebody is, is, is perhaps a little bit out of their depth. So this really sort of raises the question, well, what does it matter if people do believe these things? I mean, you know, who cares if people believe that George Bush actually planted explosives in the towers. Who actually really cares if reptiles are controlling the world and you know, maybe my friends are, might be reptiles? Does it actually really matter? Well, I'd say apart from the, um, the actual ethical issue of having some kind of commitment to the truth, I think there are reasons why it matters. And I wanted to just quote you Chomsky. One of the things that he said about 9-11 was one of the major consequences of the 9-11 movement has to be to draw enormous amounts of energy and effort away from activism directed to real and ongoing crimes of state and their institutional background. Crimes that are far more serious than blowing up the World Trade Center would have been if there were any credibility to that thesis. And he says that, I suspect, is why the 9-11 movement is treated far more tolerantly by the, by the powers that be than is the norm for actual serious activist work. So I think that's a really interesting point that at a time when we face so many serious problems in the world, and you know, where there is this appalling shortage of activists, I mean, surely none of us think, oh my God, there are just you know, millions of us, and we're poised to take over. I hope you don't, because um, yeah, well, if you do, and you've got some information to that effect, I'd like to see it, because I think most of us kind of feel, my God, we really are outnumbered, aren't we? If people are going to get distracted into campaigning about imaginary injustices, I think that's a really, really serious issue. And what's more, what you'll find is that a lot of conspiracy theorists, a bit like born-again Christians, have a kind of evangelical zeal to actually become involved in other campaign movements and use them as a platform to spread their own ideas. Now, I was partly involved with Occupy St. Paul's, uh, and they were having this problem that the truth is we're very, very drawn to it because it's such a high-profile platform to start holding up banners saying 9-11 was an inside job, so on and so forth. And Occupy, um, it was Occupied Times, their, um, their newspaper was really sort of keen to publish articles about this and sort of say, we feel we've got a little bit, sort of a, a, you know, a bit like the Socialist Worker Party, always turning up at our events. It's a kind of recognised political phenomenon called entryism, where you just try and hijack another organisation and use them as a platform to get your message across because nobody's listening to you uh, in your own right. So I think that does make it a kind of a problem. Um, I think another problem is, is you find that conspiracy theories, and particularly the extreme ones, are doing the work of the establishment for them. And to illustrate that, I'd like to read a quotation out to you and see if you can work out who actually said this. Um, and I'll try and read it in as fair and balanced a way as possible. So this person said, uh, what I saw is that this world is a complete inversion. What is considered normal is absolutely mad. I see children starving in a world of plenty. I see governments justifying pepper-bombing cities of civilians to protect those civilians from violence. 
I see banks lending people money that does not exist called credit and charging them interest on it if they don't pay it back and then taking their homes and taking their businesses and livelihoods. I see, I see a situation where the banks crashed the economy and then the banks' problem became the government's problem and by the government bailing out the banks. And then the government passes that problem on to the ordinary people in terms of the austerity programs that they inflict on, on society. Now, does anybody think that sounds unreasonable? And would you want a spokesperson representing our movement, if you like, being the one who gets on the media saying stuff like this? And would you associate that with yourselves? Would you say, yes, that's a fair representation of our point of view? If that person then goes on to say, while they're being interviewed, and the public are thinking, yeah, no, I, I, I like what this guy's saying, that, that sounds sensible, that's what those Occupy people say, isn't it? If they then go on to say that the moon isn't real, yeah, and that it's an alien mind control device that uh, was planted in the sky by reptiles, wouldn't you then think, oh, fuck. You mean it? That's exactly what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. By association, by using a very, very similar rhetoric to people who want genuine social justice and are campaigning about issues that actually have some scientific foundation behind them, you're finding that it's making people look stupid by association. It's almost as if these kind of bullshit anti-science ideas like anti-vaccination and uh, chemtrails are wrapped up in a rhetoric that gets associated with us. It's guilt by association. Everyone gets tired of the same brush, do like Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I mean, it's got to the point now. I mean, I, I have been involved with actions where we've torn up GM crops. Yeah. I'm not sure what I think about the issue anymore. You know, I find it's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm becoming increasingly less, skept uh, you know, less wary of GM crops as time goes by. But for somebody like myself, it's become impossible to have a serious debate in public about whether GM is or isn't a problem because of the hysterical talk about Monsanto are the world's most evil company. They're the world's biggest company. They're involved with chemtrails. You know, if you get this association between a rational scientific debate and these really extreme points of view, you start to look like the extremists. It's almost as if people are doing the job of the establishment for them by making us look absolutely ridiculous, by talking about stuff that can't be backed up by scientific fact. Um, if you look at the rhetoric that the anti-vaccination people use, when they talk about their deep suspicion of, of large corporations, that, that's how I talk about the world, you know? I mean, that is one of the things I say, and I find it extremely embarrassing that they use some of the same language and some of the same rhetoric, because I think, are people going to get confused between us? Um, I've actually got a conspiracy theory of my own. Uh, if you were the Koch brothers, right, and you wanted to fund climate change denial that the, um, that the chemtrail people are starting to, to talk about. The chemtrailers are now starting to say that climate change is not man-made. It's, well, it, rather, it's been made by the chemtrails that have been sprayed out the back of airplanes. If you were the Koch brothers and you could just slip them a couple of thousand pounds anonymously, wouldn't you do it? I mean, wouldn't that be a great way to discredit people like Friends of the Earth who are trying to talk in a serious way about the science of climate change? And then really my last kind of uh, concern about the relationship between the mainstream and uh, mainstream campaigning and conspiracy theories is something called fusion paranoia. Are people familiar with fusion paranoia? Okay, um, that's where what initially was kind of an anti-establishment left-wing conspiracy idea or set of ideas actually starts coming round full circle back to the right wing. And one of the most nauseating examples I've seen of this, and again, I'm sorry I can't project this a little bit bigger, is this photo montage by a really, really well-known conspiracy theorist artist called David Dees. I've actually talked to this guy directly and tried to sort of say to him, do you not understand, like, if on the one hand you start talking about the Patriot Act, yeah, and producing quite witty graphics about it, you then produce something like that, saying that Bin Laden and Timothy McVeigh and Hitler were all framed by the Zionists. Can you not see that this is just absolutely ridiculous? 
And it becomes really creepy. If you start believing that there is this mass world conspiracy, you start associating it with Zionism, and then you start denying the Holocaust. That's when it becomes really, really quite dark, I think. So it isn't just that it might be embarrassing for us. I think it's of political concern that rather than being a sort of a rabbit hole, which is the image that um, conspiracy theorists always use, go down the rabbit hole and find out what's down there. I don't think it's a rabbit hole. I think it's a slippery slope. Once you start losing your grip on, on scientific techniques for actually being able to understand whether something is true or not, once you start lowering your critical standards to the point where you'll just believe any nonsense that you read on the internet without checking what mainstream experts think, without checking what serious investigative, investigative journalists think, it's a slippery slope. And at the bottom of it is this really nasty mess where you start coming back round in a circle and promoting neo-Nazi ideas. I think that's when it becomes extremely sinister. Um, and this guy is mainstream. You might not have heard of him, but amongst the conspiracy theories, theorists, this guy is, you know, he's like a god. People love his graphics. I've tried discussing it with him on the internet, and of course, he just becomes extremely angry and told me that I was a Zionist agent. Which is just, I mean, I wish I was. Because, I mean, I, I gather it's quite well paid. <laughs> I would really, really like that to be the case. So, really, um, that's kind of what I wanted to say on the subject and see if we can take a few questions. I'm sorry this has um, wandered on for so long. What I would say, and I did put it in the description of how we go about dealing with this, is I'm sorry to say this, I think we need to drop our levels of tolerance. I think we need to stop saying it doesn't matter if somebody joins our campaign and wants to use it as a platform to talk about chemtrails. It doesn't matter if they believe in lizards as long as they're saying stuff that's similar to ours, and as long as they're making up numbers at the protest camps, it's a good thing. It isn't. We need to demonstrate as a movement that what we say is based on extremely high standards of evidence, and we can prove what we say, and it's actually based on fact. Otherwise, why should people take us seriously? Um, and that's really, I'm sorry, we've got virtually no time left for questions, which is really uh, a plot on my behalf. <laughs> Is that you want? I can very quickly, I mean, I know you're bursting to... Yeah, um, I'm, I think you've missed out one of two points. First of all, the, the uh, phrase conspiracy theory comes from the CIA, from a memo sent out by the CIA to try and um, quiet the scepticism about the Warren Commission report as the Kennedy assassination. Mm. So it's, a, it's an idea that comes from intelligence services. Um, Why does that matter, can I ask? Um, well, it's well, about it where the phrase came from. It's about manipulation of, of uh, they sent it out to media outlets. They, they were telling the media. Does that mean that therefore they must be true? Well, How is it relevant? No, you're using a term that the intelligence services coined. The second point I want to make is that if you call yourself a skeptic, then you also have to be skeptical about official stories I that agree. appear in the media. Hmm. Right. And the third point is that you seem to like to join in 9-11 Kennedy with obviously absolutely lunatic um, conspiracy theories. Um, and I'm skeptical about the official report about 9-11. I don't campaign about it, I'm not in it. But what it's done is it's given me a different perspective on history. Right? And I think it's an important, it's an important perspective on the human world. Mm -hmm. um, that's my point. Well, I mean, kind of you're right, I've, I've been meaning to stop using the term conspiracy theory and use the term conspiracy myth, um, because I think a theory is something that actually has some kind of scientific credibility as a term. A, a theory is something waiting to be examined by other scientists. Um, the official story of 9-11 is a conspiracy theory. 19 guys got together, conspired to blow up planes into buildings. That's a conspiracy theory. There's very little evidence that supports that. That's, that's not correct. There is actually evidence to support that. Well, it's evidence drawn from torture. Well, anyway, anyway well, so no, if you no. want to accept evidence drawn from torture, no, no, that no, guy no. was waterboarded 180 times. That's the basis of the 9-11 uh, Commission report, is the torture okay. statement. That isn't actually the case. But anyway, does that it is actually the case. I, you've it asked is a question. The case. I mean, you've asked a question. Yeah, yeah. You've asked a question, and it I'm going to let somebody the case, else. Two people want to keep asking questions. It's all gang up. I don't, well, I don't think no, because you're not letting other people get a chance. Well, I, you know, you're just making bland statements. Would this not be the case that this 
Yeah, cool. I think like everything in life, it's about balance, isn't it? It's not good to believe everything the corporate media tells you, but it's not good to believe everything that like David Knight is about. Yeah. I think the truth lies somewhere in between those two things. Really. But, um, right. You've got to be open-minded. You yeah. mustn't be so open minded that your brain falls out. Exactly, yeah, true. Totally, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, like you said, believe. Yeah. But I think at one stage that we all thought that the, well, hundreds of years ago, that people thought that the Earth was flat, and it, it could have been the majority consensus among scientists that, oh no, we, we know, oh, we've got proof here, the Earth's flat, and anyone who said the Earth wasn't flat would have been in fact ridiculed, so I think that's also another. But I'm not saying I said believe in. in People haven't uh, people haven't believed in the flat earth. I don't. I mean, regarding nine eleven stuff, I, um, I don't. I don't tend to believe the conspiracies about that. But the building seven thing that wasn't hit by a plane, I find that a bit bizarre. The way, not 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 the fact that it fell by fire, but the fact that the building seven fell the way it did, like literally, like you know, a demolition because you know, like buildings can burn for twenty four hours and they wouldn't necessarily fall. So I find that a bit weird, but. I don't necessarily think the government got together to. I think the government, I think the United States government made the most of 9 11 to go and attack Iraq, but I don't necessarily think it was. Um, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm sort of not able to mind up fully about it all, but. I'm really pretty sure. Is that, is that actually accurate? It seems to be on 10 to 4 for about. Um, it's 9 minutes to 4. <laughs> oh, okay, so we could, we could actually. I mean, do people want. Yeah, go. So I'll take you next. Science makes I actually agree with you. People, I agree with you. You can all say to us a consensus. If all, if all scientists say one thing, it must be true. Like I've, 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 I've definitely got your point, and, unless you want to address it, do you? No, I'm just thinking, that, I just think generally with the discomfort and the saturation of conspiracy theories, it can just be a distraction technique. Like, you're talking about <coughs> the real problems and from the actual real things that actually need to be committed. Sometimes I think people can get so carried away with, with the conspiracy that actually the real points get missed, um, in my opinion. I think it's really interesting the way that you said that. I think just structuring something like a, a, it might be an academic writing, you know, with an academic write, piece of writing, there has to be a structured argument. And like, I think it's a really good point to think that, you know, uh, why not, I, mean, I guess, people who could be answering the conspiracy theorists, why, why isn't there kind of a bit more of that dialogue? Well, is, is this that they have no time for this? They think it's not even worth trying to re establish a balance somehow? And this is a book called Rebel Cell, if anyone's read it, that's quite interesting and touches on some of these issues. Um, I don't think you've read Rebel Cell. No, no, no. It's a really good book. It kind of um, it looks at the kind of Adbusters model and looks at how that actually feeds into the. It becomes a kind of everything you can kind of get into getting commodified and sold back to the the system. So it just looks at how this kind of really kind of anti stance can actually end up feeding the thing it's trying to oppose. <laughs> Quite interesting. But I think with conspiracy theories, that's kind of the point you were making. It, it ends up feeding the thing it's trying Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the, the problem is. Um, you, know, you, you can find all the evidence that you require to sort of see that the case that's being put forward for a controlled demolition doesn't actually hold together. Yeah? Now, I know our, our friend here would strongly disagree with that, but I'm going to try, sort of, try and address what you've said as well about how scientific consensus works. You can't sort of say that as long as the majority say something, it must be true. That's not how science works. My, my background is actually... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, and I'm about to agree with you. Well, can I? Can I? What size is the proof? Can let me, let me actually address and answer the question. Yeah. What I'm saying, science doesn't work by by just saying consensus is something fixed that we all must obey. What you have to do is you have to put to forward a theory, right? You have to see whether it can be tested. It has to be phrased in such a way that other scientists can examine it and look for flaws in the theory that's been put forward. If you then find that 90% or 
of the experts in that field say, this does appear to hold water. This theory that you have does actually seem to match the data. That's what you call scientific consensus. It doesn't mean that it's frozen in time forever, because somebody may come along with a new observation that will dismantle that. And that's how science works. Every observation, every theory that science upholds is provisional. It's just the working model that appears to fit the data at any given time. So we may end up changing our minds, for instance, about the Big Bang. I mean, there's, a, there's new information coming to light now, which is actually starting to question the Big Bang, which has been an orthodoxy for a long time. It doesn't mean to say that the orthodoxy is fixed. The point is, if you make an extraordinary claim, yeah, such as that vaccines are actually poisoning people and giving them autism, you have to provide extraordinary proof to go with that. You can't just say, here is one tiny little inconsistency in the data. You have to put forward um, a serious piece of research that other scientists can then look at and try and dismantle. If they can't dismantle it, it becomes the new consensus. So I'm not suggesting that as you know, we constantly slavishly obey what the majority say. The scientists have sometimes been wrong about things. They were wrong about pl plate tectonics. When the theory of plate tectonics came in, Scientists, or geologists, went into denial. They would not countenance this. It took about 20 years for that theory to be accepted. But it did get accepted because the facts backed it up. So I'm not saying just slavishly agree with whatever the scientific consensus happens to be forever. But you have to produce seriously robust information to dismantle that consensus because it appears to be the working model at any given time. You've been waiting for absolutely ages. Yeah, I have a couple of things. I was thinking about what you said about manipulation of pictures, and I was thinking of that BP thing now, uh, the, re the response they put out to, and also they like, turned out to be, apparently, I'll be careful there, because I've not got them, apparently it was a, a lot of photoshopping going on, so BP did the only with the Oslick in the Mexican Gulf, mm. and a lot of it was uh, torn apart by photographic analysts, and I'm thinking that's a kind of example of disinformation? I, I just can't comment on something that I know nothing okay. about. I, I just haven't come across that one. But there was a, if I can just take one question at a time. <laughs> sorry. Can't hear you, I'm afraid, sorry. The, the prevalence of conspiracy theories is like a symptom of like a mistrust in the scientific community. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, I think it's really, really, uh, I think there are reasons why conspiracy theories are so prevalent. I mean, if you take the way in which the tobacco industry behaved yeah, and covered up information that was actually needed by the public in order to protect their health, systematic, deliberate covering up of scientific data went on. Not by the scientists. The scientists were trying to get that information out, but it was media corporate control that prevented that becoming popularly known. You get a very, very similar thing um, uh, with climate change. You know, I mean, I'm old enough to remember the first days of scientists starting to say, this is extremely serious. The way in which big oil behaved towards the scientists was fucking outrageous. There's very, very good reasons for mistrusting the way in which corporates handle and governments handle information like that. But what's really ironic is that it was the scientific consensus it was scientists themselves who fought those conspiracy theories. People who sort of say, oh, 9-11 was an inside job, treat the scientists who say to them, no, I'm sorry, you know, the physics of buildings, there's nothing inconsistent in what happened. They get treated with utter contempt and told that they're paid industry shills. And that they're all, no, 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 and they get, they get treated as absolute bastards by conspiracy theory people. But, of course, it turns out that scientists who often do uncover conspiracy. It's absolutely extraordinary that you can have this dualistic attitude to, 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 to people who are actually experts within the field. Another question? Go on. Some people still believe that it's flat. You have to speak up. Some people still believe that it's flat. That's... There's that, there's that website called oh, yeah. the Fire Society. <laughs> and there are loads and loads of uh, documentation about it to prove it's actually still flat. <laughs> but, yeah. And the geocentrists are making a comeback as well. People who believe that the Earth is at the centre of the solar system. 
Yeah. They actually managed to get, um, you know, uh, Captain Jane away from Star Trek? No. <laughs> yeah, they managed to get her to narrate their movie, saying that the, uh, uh, it's a, it's a revolution science going. I actually wrote to her, uh, and then uh, hopefully, I'd like to think it was a result of my letter, she then turned around and said, whoa, I didn't fucking realise what this film was about. Which happened to be a man um, but no, the, the, the flat earth thing is very interesting because when we were talking about scientific consensus earlier, um, people haven't believed in a flat earth since the time of the Greeks. I mean, mainstream science has never said that the earth is flat. I mean, science didn't exist before that period. It's easy to measure that the earth is a sphere but using two sticks uh, at different locations around the earth. It's been known since then. This story that Columbus had to argue with um, the scientists in Ferdinand and Isabella's court to let him go sailing around the world. This idea that they were telling him, no, you'll fall off the edge. <laughs> He's a myth that Washington Irving put together. You know, Washington Irving, the writer, he, is, uh, he wrote this biography of Columbus that was completely inaccurate, and that bit stuck. People haven't believed the Earth is flat, apart from the tiny <laughs> bunch of crazies. They haven't believed it since um, the time of uh, the Greeks. You know? So that's... that's in itself, a bit of a kind of popular myth that, that anybody's ever thought that it was anything other than a sphere. Uh, incredible that, that the Greeks knew it was a sphere. Um, but I think that's the end of our session. Thanks very much. To, uh, and I'll be on my stall if anybody wants to talk about this further. I'd be happy to chat to you.